Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. The ceasefire between Israel and Gaza has been extended for five days as of Wednesday, August 13th. The remaining issues for negotiations include the lifting of the blockade on Gaza, as demanded by Hamas, and the demilitarization of the Gaza Strip, which is what Israel wants. The UN Human Rights Commission has also announced who will participate in the investigation of war crimes committed during Operation Protective Edge. And Israeli officials have already criticized the inquiry, saying that outcome is predetermined and biased against Israel. The deadline for the report is March 2015. During that assault, more than 60 Israelis died, mostly soldiers, and more than 1,900 Palestinians died, who were mostly civilians. Joining us now from Turkey is Richard Falk. He joins us via phone. Richard is a professor emeritus of international law at Princeton University, and in 2008, the United Nations Human Rights Council appointed Richard to a six-year term as a UN Special Rapporteur on Palestinian Human Rights. Thank you for joining us, Richard. I'm glad to be with you, Jessica. So, Richard, let's get your take on the latest news regarding the ceasefire extension. How durable does the ceasefire look, and does a long-term ceasefire seem sustainable? Well, I think it's hard to imagine a long-term ceasefire without some kind of movement toward a long-term territorial solution. It's one thing to lift the blockade, which certainly should be done and will create a temporary sense of relative normalcy in Gaza, which is in uh, desperate uh, humanitarian uh, straits at the moment, it's not only because of the, the attack of the last few weeks, but even uh, before that, because it was blockaded, the tunnels had been destroyed by Egypt, which it had relied upon uh, since uh, 2007 to get many of it, the basic necessities of life. And so the situation of Gaza has to be addressed in a more fundamental way than a demilitarization versus blockade. And demilitarization is a tricky move to expect Hamas to make because it, in effect, uh, makes uh, Gaza totally vulnerable uh, to whatever Israel decides to do. Uh, it's always been somewhat vulnerable, but if they really do agree to demilitarization, whatever that actually means, uh, it would totally uh, make it appear that Hamas had uh, surrendered its capacity to resist what it regards to be an unlawful and unjust occupation. Now, the negotiations are taking place in Cairo, and I wanted to get your perspective on what Egypt's role is in all of this, and also other Gulf states and other players in the, in the region. Do you think that they could play a more positive role during these negotiations? Well, it's rather surprising that Egypt is playing any role at the moment, because it has uh, been very hostile to Hamas uh, ever since the Egyptian coup back in the middle of 2013. Uh, before that, uh, the Egyptians could play an intermediary role, which they did to end the last major Israeli attack, which was in November of 2012. But now, uh, Egypt is very closely aligned to the U.S. seems to have encouraged Israel to uh, attack Gaza because it, too, was deeply opposed to Hamas, which it regards rather misleadingly as an extension of the Muslim Brotherhood, which uh, the CC government in Egypt has criminalized and has been responsible for a very bloody crackdown. More uh, possible as real uh, political agents of some kind of conflict resolution process are Turkey and Qatar. 
both of whom have tried to uh, exercise uh, some kind of diplomatic initiative which responds to the humanitarian crisis that has uh, that is afflicting Gaza, but also uh, is uh, opposing Israel's uh, disproportionate and uh, probably uh, illegal uh, initiation of this whole uh, round of uh, violence. It's a very strange situation that's emerged in the region because uh, Saudi Arabia, which is a uh, strongly fundamentalist Islamic uh, government, also gave Israel a green light to attack uh, Gaza because it is more fearful of the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas than it is of uh, Israel and uh, what Israel represents uh, that it has opposed over the years. There's a new sectarian dimension of regional politics that is quite confusing because it has two levels. One level is the two types of Islam, uh, uh, Sunni Islam, which is represented by the Saudi Arabian and Egyptian uh, societies, and Shiite Islam, which is associated primarily with Iran. And then you have the second level, which is the fear of the monarchies, particularly in the Gulf, of any kind of grassroots political Islam. And that's what the Muslim Brotherhood is. It's not a movement uh, that is associated with the state. It's a movement that's associated with the general population. So it's a bottom-up challenge to uh, authoritarian rule uh, that was... Uh, present particularly in Egypt uh, during the Mubarak era. So what Saudi Arabia portrays and symbolizes is this extreme anxiety about any democratizing movement by the people, uh, even if it has a strong Islamic character, and it prefers an authoritarian leader like Mubarak or Sisi, to the possibility of uh, the sort of democratically elected leader that Egypt had during the year that uh, Mohamed Morsi was in power. Mm. But with this sort of democratic identity that you mentioned the Muslim Brotherhood having and um, sort of an offshoot uh, Hamas has as well. There's also this this identity that at least in the United States is constantly perpetuated of them being a terrorist organization. So can you more or less give us give us the facts here, Richard? How would you identify yes, Hamas in all a, this? That's a, that, uh, that's a very uh, important and, in my view, uh, confusing. Uh, understanding of both the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas. Muslim Brotherhood uh, decades ago uh, renounced violence as a tactic and although they've been called a terrorist organization by the Egyptian military and particularly by General Sisi since he has taken control in the middle of 2013, uh, there's no real substantive foundation for calling the Egyptian uh, Muslim Brotherhood a uh, violent organization, much less a terrorist organization. They've been uh, brutally repressed, and in retaliation, it's possible that they uh, have engaged in some violent acts, but they are definitely committed to a nonviolent political strategy. They were elected in five successive elections in Egypt, uh, both to the parliament and to the presidency. Hamas, which emerged as a resistance movement uh, in uh, Israel, in the West Bank and uh, 
uh, Gaza, particularly Gaza after the uh, 67 war, did engage in terrorist activities up to about 2006. It was responsible for suicide bombings and the like. But since 2006, uh, when it was encouraged by the U.S. Uh, to participate in elections in Gaza, it's adopted essentially a political strategy. But it had the misfortune to win those elections, which wasn't expected in Gaza, and since then has been uh, categorized as a terrorist organization subject to the blockade, subject to the loss of um, uh, foreign economic assistance, which Gaza really depends upon, uh, and has been uh, punished, even though, as I say, it sent numerous signals that it would uh, respect uh, long-term ceasefire, that if the blockade were lifted and if Israel were to uh, retreat to the 1967 uh, borders, it would uh, uh, accept a 50-year coexistence uh, framework, peaceful coexistence. When uh, Hamas came into power in Gaza, uh, the Prime Minister, Hania, uh, sent a uh, confidential message to uh, George W. Bush while he was president saying there's too much violence in the region. We want uh, to end the chaos and we're ready to enter into this long-term uh, political accommodation, which implicitly acknowledge the uh, validity of Israel's existence. That message and other efforts to uh, signal the same intention uh, was never responded to, and there was in fact an attempt to overthrow the Hamas uh, governing authority in uh, Gaza by relying on some uh, parts of a very uh, extremist part of the Fatah uh, PLO organization. So the the reality is that there was a real opportunity to find an accommodation uh, with Hamas that could have avoided uh, this tragic sequence of events that have. Uh, evolved since uh, 2006. And we should know from the uh, experience with uh, South Africa and with Northern Ireland that if you want to make uh, peace with a resistance movement, you have to begin by treating them as a political actor, particularly when, as is the case with Hamas, they signaled that intention. I've had conversations with the two leaders uh, of Hamas, uh, Khalad Mashel and uh, Marzouk, uh, both of whom, in separate conversations, reinforced this uh, conception that's so contrary to what the media portrays, which is this desire to work out some kind of sustainable peace with Israel. And uh, it may not be their real motives, but it's been a tragic mistake, in my view, not to explore whether this kind of diplomacy would have led to a, a stabilization and normalization and eventually to some kind of secure peace. Yeah. All right, Richard, just really quickly, final question. I wanted to ask you about this recent news that came out today, the White House instru instructed the Pentagon to put a shipment of Hellfire missiles to Israel on hold. Do you see this move reflecting a sort of diplomatic shift between Israel and the United States? It's so hard to tell, Jessica. It could be, and uh, some are interpreting it in that way. It could also be nothing more than some kind of technical uh, approval process that has uh, sometimes uh, complicated the relationship between the White House and the Pentagon on 
these kinds of sensitive arms sales. There was another related development, which was the fact that the Pentagon, without consulting the White House, uh, sent a lot of munitions and weapons to Israel in the midst of the attack, which sort of involved, implicated the United States in Israel's policies as a uh, country that is uh, potentially complicit with the attack itself. All right, Richard Falk joining us from Turkey. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm glad to have had the opportunity. Thank you so much, Jessica. And in part two of our conversation, we'll have Richard on to discuss further the United Nations, what's next for negotiations, and please stay tuned for, for that second part. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.